All right. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Darren Moncton. He's uh, an absolute giant in the field of not only myotonic dystrophy, but continuing on the theme of cross um, crosstalk between different repeat uh, expansion diseases. Darren's done a lot of work uh, across a number of different repeat expansions. And I think that's what, that's what he's going to tell us about is this, uh, these shared insights. You haven't heard me talk yet. That's a bit, uh, um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, right. Thanks, Eric, for that very generous uh, introduction. And thanks, Charles and MDF, for inviting me to talk today, not about myotonic dystrophy, about, but about Huntington's disease. And again, uh, as we heard there from the overlap between what's going on in uh, Fuchs disease and myotonic dystrophy, again, I think there's potentially some lessons to be learned from, from uh, Huntington's disease. And again, maybe some paradigms for how we might think about larger uh, genetic studies in, in myotonic dystrophy. All right, before I do that, so these are my disclosures. So obviously they're there, make of those what you will. So again, just to make sure everybody's up to speed, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Huntington's disease, uh, what it is. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this, but Huntington's disease is a, is a late onset neurodegenerative disorder. It primarily affects the striatum in the brain and the primary symptoms associated with that are a movement disorder, so uncontrolled movements. Uh, it's a very progressive disorder, so death usually occurs about 10 to 15 years after the onset of those motor symptoms. Uh, and as the disease progresses, other regions of the brain become involved. Uh, and obviously that uh, is characterized by behavioral changes, and also by uh, cognitive effects as well. And much like in myotonic dystrophy, there's actually, if you look carefully, you can see the onset of symptoms, typically about 10 to 20 years before the overt motor symptoms present. So this is another disorder associated with the expansion of a simple sequence repeat. So CAG repeat in exon one of the, the Huntington gene varies from about nine to 30 in the general population and from 36 up to 100 or so in the patient population. There's a kind of a, a reduced penetrance range from about 36 to 39. Pretty much everybody with 40 repeats, if they live long enough, will develop the symptoms vast majority of patients have between about 40 and 50, but those who inherit up into the 50s, 60s, and 70s have a juvenile onset form of the disease. But again, it's broadly similar, but has some slightly different phenotypes. So this is an autosomal dominant disorder, just like DM1. And again, it's in the coding Stay there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mover, so I'm really having struggled to stay there. But anyway, um, so this is an autosomal dominant disorder. The CAG repeat is in exon one, and it's a coding repeat. So it results in the production of a protein with an enlarged uh, polyglutamine tract in the protein. And the assumption is that the primary root of downstream pathology is a gain of function of that polyglutamine containing protein. When you have a large protein uh, like that in the cell, it can form aggregates. And again, if you have enough of that protein uh, with a large enough repeat, then pretty much everything you look at in the cell goes wrong. So there's mitochondrial dysfunction, intracellular transport goes wrong, proteolysis uh, lysis goes wrong, there's transcriptional dysregulation, all sorts of things go wrong in those cells. So... Uh, just like as I alluded to just now, there's a very strong correlation between the number of repeats inherited and the age of onset of the symptoms, very similar to what we see in myotonic dystrophy. So again, and here we see on the uh, x-axis is the number of CAG repeats inherited, and on the y-axis is the age of onset, and you'll see there that it's a strong inverse correlation. The more repeats an individual inherits, the earlier the age of onset. What's uh, uh, really nice on this slide here is that we're using the data from the Enroll HD cohort. So this is an amazing resource for research into Huntington's disease. It's a cohort now of over 20,000 individuals that have extensive longitudinal clinical data associated with them and biobanked samples. And this is uh, the data now from age of onset from the 14,000 or so individuals who have uh, a have motor onset. Again, there's another large group of individuals who are pre-motor onset, but are still nonetheless providing valuable information. So quite clearly then, 
the number of repeats is a major modifier of the relative severity of the disease. But nonetheless, this phenotype is still highly modifiable. So if we just look at those individuals there with 42 repeats, you can see the average age of onset is probably around 50, but there are some individuals inherit getting the symptoms at age 20 and others not getting the symptoms until up into their 70s and 80s, even though they've inherited the same number of repeats. So this tells us that the phenotype is not not written in stone, there is ways to modify that. Obviously, the expectation is that some of that is going to be environmental modifiers, as we alluded to just now in Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. But the assumption is that a large part of that will also be genetic in nature. And obviously, then we have approaches, particularly when we have large, well characterized cohorts, to be able to identify what those genetic modifiers might be. And again, the idea would then be that if we understood what those genetic modifiers might be, that might provide us with more druggable targets. And the idea, if we could understand why there are that subset of people who get the symptoms early and try and prevent whatever's giving them the early symptoms or understand why other people are relatively protective and apply that knowledge to the everybody, then we could hopefully uh, delay the onset or even improve the, 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 the presentation of the disease. So again, the primary resource now we're going to take forward then is residual variation in age of onset. So we use that line that predicts when someone will get the symptoms to work out whether they got the symptoms later than we would have expected or earlier than we would have expected given the number of CAG repeats inherited. So that essentially gives us a normal distribution centered around zero. And the easiest way to think about that is everybody to the left has an earlier onset than we expected and everybody to the right has a later onset than we expected. So we can now use that as a phenotype in a genome-wide association study. So this is not a case control study, as is alluded to, and, and found the TCF4 gene. We're taking everybody who has Huntington disease and ask whether they got the symptoms earlier or later than we would have expected. And the data I'm presenting here is generated by the Genetic Modifiers of HD Consortium. This is a group that's been running for about 10 years or so now, uh, including groups at uh, Mass General, Jim Gasella and co, Michael uh, Orth in Ulm, Jeff Long and Jim Mills in Iowa, and the Cardiff group uh, comprising Leslie Jones and, and Peter Holmans and their, all the, the guys that work for them, and our group now in Glasgow. Again, this is data from the... Uh, a GUR called one to five that includes primarily now enroll HD patients, but also includes a couple of earlier studies that were from some different subsets and the HD registry, which is again was a precursor to the to the enroll HD study. So what was the expectation when this this uh, work was done? was that this was going to be finding modifiers of HD. And again, the expectation is that we would find variants in genes associated with neuronal health, for instance, and or genes associated with the processing of protein aggregates or mitochondrial function. All of those types of pathways is what reasonably expected to come up. So what actually did come up? So actually, you see all of those genes there in pink are genes from the DNA mismatch repair pathway. So these are all genes that we know from prior studies are involved in the process of genetic instability, particularly from mouse models, in the process of somatic expansion of the, the CAG and CTG repeats that we see in both DM1 and other animal models. So this was strongly suggesting that maybe actually the process of somatic expansion that was known about in HD is actually really important in the onset of the disease. So what other genes came up? Another gene came up, FAN1. This is another DNA repair gene. Prior to this observation, it had no known role in the somatic expansion process. But subsequently, uh, Karen Usden, uh, the MGH group, other groups, and Sarah Tabrizi's group have shown that this gene is also regulates the rate of somatic expansion. What about these other genes here? We have these genes T-Surge1 and RM2B. Again, the role of these genes is currently not known. So again, plausible that they might have some role in somatic expansion, or it might be that they are involved in some of those downstream processes. But what's quite clear is nonetheless, the majority of the genes coming up here are involved in DNA repair. Actually, what we also found was a hit at the Huntington's disease locus, and I'll come back later on to explain why that locus comes up as well. Again, given that we thought we'd already corrected for the number of CAG repeats, we didn't expect the HTT gene to come up, uh, but there's a reason why it does.
Okay. So what I've talked about there is using age of onset as a phenotype. Age of onset's great in that there's one number for everybody. And we kind of broadly think we know what it means. Although again, as in myotonic dystrophy, it's somewhat subjective as to when the symptoms actually start. And again, particularly again, when people are already symptomatic, trying to remember, go backwards to determine when it started again can be quite problematic. So what we've also been doing going forward, again, particularly with the uh, help of the, the groups in, in Iowa, the statisticians there, is can we use some of the other longitudinal data to come up with additional types of phenotypes that are potentially more objective than the, the age of onset? So this is looking at total motor score. So this is a, a series of measures that are used to come up and determine how well someone is actually able to control their movements. And with that large data set, what the statistician has been able to do is to predict a trajectory for anyone, for the average person with 42 CAG repeats. And then what we can do is choose a particular threshold, in this case, TMS 30. And then we can look at the longitudinal data from any one individual and ask, when did they cross that threshold? And how does that relate to that predicted line for the average person with CAG 42? Because you can see that this person here shifted to the left. So they cross that line earlier than we had expected. So they have a more severe form of the disease. And that's great when they cross the line actually with the longitudinal data. But again, one of the problems obviously can be that actually the, some people haven't yet got to that point. So this is someone here who is earlier in the disease course. They haven't yet crossed that threshold. But again, using their longitudinal data, we can extrapolate forward and predict when they would cross that threshold. This person you can see is less is for, is closer to the line so they are more typical of an average patient and again that work and work backwards as well so this other patient over here on the right again they were already past that threshold but again we can extrapolate backwards and predict the um that they got the symptoms or across that line later than we would have expected so again we can use this type of phenotype in the genetic modifier study as well so this is again just going back to the age of onset data uh, based on 9,000 individuals. This next one here is based on a subset of those individuals, only around about 7,000 individuals, because we don't have longitudinal data for that full cohort. But what you'll nonetheless see is that actually the average signal strength has gone up. So many of these peaks are higher in this analysis than they were, even though there's fewer individuals. So using that rich source of longitudinal data coming up with more objective measures increases the power to find genetic modifiers. Uh, and you'll see there, most of those genes are the same. Most of them have gone up. Some of them have actually gone down. So nonetheless, there still is different phenotypes have different power to reveal particular genetic modifiers. And again, I'm going to show you one other. Oh, yeah, that, that's actually brought up a new gene here, CCDC82. Again, was just below the line of significance with age of onset, but goes well above the line with this particular phenotype. And this is now a different phenotype. So this is the symbol digit modality test. So this is more a test of cognition. And what you'll notice here is that the FAN1 signal has gone down, but the MSH3 signal has come up to be much more significant. And again, that's illustrating probably two things that different phenotypes have different powers to detect uh, particular modifiers. And again, that may indicate that different genes are having different effects in different cell types to mediate those effects, or it may be that the genetic variants that are underlying these signals, again, have different actions in different cell types that, again, give different effect sizes on this type of association. Okay, so we got this data then that strongly suggests that somatic expansion may be uh, the mechanism by which those DNA mismatch repair genes mediate differences in HD severity. So one way we can potentially uh, look at that is by doing high throughput sequencing and measuring directly somatic expansion. So we've come up with a MySeq assay that uh, gives us the sequence of the repeats uh, in terms of the CAG repeats. There's also a downstream CCG repeat that's also polymorphic and intervening sequence that is well polymorphic. And this assay gives us both somatic expansion and the intervening sequence. So what do we know about somatic expansion in blood then? That it's clearly age dependent. So this is showing some data now from a whole bunch of individuals with 45 repeats. The older they are, the more somatic expansion there is in blood. We've now done that on 
4,000 individuals. And you can see here that the amount of somatic expansion is dependent on the number of repeats and the age of the individual. When we correct for those two factors, we can get a new molecular phenotype now, where again, we can uh, divide people essentially into two groups. Those are expanding less uh, rapidly than we than average, and those are expanding more rapidly than average. We can now use that as our phenotype in a genome-wide association study. Uh, and again, these are the, the primary data that are coming out of that. So what are we seeing? We're seeing many of the same DNA mismatch repair genes that came up in the clinical phenotypes. We've actually now got some additional DNA repair genes that weren't detected as modifying the clinical phenotypes, but are still modifying the amount of somatic expansion filled in some of the gaps that we might have predicted from the animal models. Uh, what we haven't seen here ever is a couple of those genes, LIG1 and PMS1, again, that came up in the clinical phenotypes, not coming up in this blood instability. And again, that may be, again, to do with cell type specificity and or mode of action of some of those variants. But what we also don't see are those T-SERG1, RM2B and CCDC82 genes. And again, we think that's probably because those really aren't modifying instability and they probably are modifiers of downstream processes. But again, given that not all of these things uh, match up, it's possible they still could be involved in instability, at least in some way. Uh, and again, what we've got now is a new locus on chromosome 17 that contains several genes near to each other. We don't know what the causative gene there is. We think it probably is ATAD5. There's some data that suggests that may have a role in DNA mismatch repair as well. Okay, further proof then that we're linking those clinical variation phenotypes with the underlying genetic variants through the process of somatic expansion is shown here, where we see that there's an inverse correlation between the rate of somatic expansion in blood and the residual variation age of onset. So those who are expanding their repeat more rapidly are getting the symptoms earlier than we would have expected. That's a highly significant association, but the effect size is relatively modest. And that's because we're measuring somatic instability in blood where we think that the actual somatic expansion that's driving the disease process is happening in the brain. And although the blood instability is probably paralleling broadly what goes on in the blood in the brain, it's probably not exactly the same. And we, in fact, have some evidence that maybe some of those genetic modifiers are actually going in opposite directions between their effects in brain and their effects in blood. And again, kind of consistent with that observation is some old work from a colleague of mine, Peggy Shelbourne, who showed probably nearly 20 years ago now that in Huntington's disease patients who are inheriting 40, 50 repeats, that some of the neurons in the brain have acquired hundreds or even thousands of extra repeats. And this now work is being uh, replicated using single cell type technology and uh, cell sorting technology. And again, really cl clearly showing that these expansions in the brain are really highly specific to the striated neurons that then go on and die. So strongly suggesting that somatic expansion is important. Um, yeah, then what I just wanted to do is come back quickly to that signal at the HTT locus. Again, we're seeing primarily in the clinical phenotype. So what is driving that signal? So the CAG repeat is present in exon 1. CAG codes for glutamine is actually a downstream code on CAA that also codes for glutamine and then another CAG. So the actual length of the polyglutamine tract in a typical HD patient is too longer than the number of CAG repeats. And that's what the vast majority of European HD patients have. But there are a couple of slightly altered flavors of the repeat where there's a duplication of that CAA, CAG. So in that case, the polyglutamine is four units longer than the CAG repeat. And then there's another flavor of allyl where they don't have any CAA interruptions. And in that case, the CAG equals the number of polyglutamines. So again, the prior expectation here was that the more glutamines you inherited, the worse the symptoms would be. So let's just ask that question now again in this particular cohort of about four, uh, three and a half thousand individuals. So that's the typical patients with the standard structure where glutamine is too longer than the number of uh, CAGs. What about those with the duplication? So these individuals have an extra two uh, 
glutamines relative to their CAG length or four relative to their CAG length. So those individuals are shifted to the right. So they tend to have a later onset than we would have expected. Those who've lost the interruption where the number of CAGs equals the number of glutamines, now they're shifted to the left. So they have a much earlier onset than we would expect it. And again, our primary explanation for that is that actually the somatic instability is driven primarily by the number of pure repeats and not by the number of glutamines encoded. So if we now correct that for the number of CAG repeats, then these individuals come in much closer. But they're still not completely corrected. Those, particularly those people who have no interruptions still seem to have a much earlier onset than we would have expected. Again, that led us to look even more closely and again, look at that downstream and intervening sequence and look at the CCG repeat. Again, we've shown that variation in the CCG repeat actually has, the, the length of the CCG alone has no impact. Uh, but again, that CCG codes for proline. And again, there are other nearby codons that also code for proline, including a CCA uh, repeat and a CCT downstream. And again, that region also in occurs in different flavors and in different combinations with the glutamine encoding repeats. So there's uh, where we've lost the CAA and uh, have the usual downstream structure, where we've lost the CAA in the glutamine and the CCA in the proline, and one where we've retain the CAA and the glutamine, but lost the CCA and the protein. Again, now in these very, although those alloys are very large, very rare, when we have large cohorts, we can uh, uh, still get a reasonable number of those cases. So again, that's the duplication again, slightly elder, later on than we'd expected. The people with the double loss clearly having a much earlier onset. Those who've retained the CAA and lost the CCA look like they're maybe slightly earlier than we would expect. But those that have lost the CAA and retained the CCA in the proline stretch look like they're about what we would have expected. So, and again, if we look at the stats on that, again, we can see that, oops, sorry, the, uh, the loss of the CCA in the proline, so again, doesn't affect the number of prolines doesn't affect the sequence of the protein. Nonetheless, this synonymous variant appears to have a big impact on disease severity. And again, through a mechanism at the moment, we don't completely understand. Could be that it's affecting somatic instability. It doesn't affect somatic instability in blood, but maybe those sequence changes are affecting somatic instability in the brain. Obviously, we need brain tissue to test that directly. Or it could be implicating some other part of the pathogenic process. So again, that's a region that's likely involved in the stability of the, the mRNA transcript, possibly modulates translation efficiency, and may also modulate modulate uh, RAN translation efficiency. And uh, Laura has recently published, or Ranham's recently published some data in SCAR8, where the exact sequence of the repeat can modulate RNA structures, and that can then modulate tran RAN translation efficiency. So again, something there we don't yet understand, but is having a big impact on the symptoms. So again, if we understood that, could provide therapeutic opportunities. So what do we know then? Longer repeats cause more severe disease. Large somatic expansions accrue in the affected tissues. Individual specific variation in the expansion rate associates with individual specific variation in disease. Variant repeats reduce somatic instability, reduce uh, disease severity in the CAG repeat at least. And the GWAR candidate uh, and gene studies link somatic expansion with the genes that also modify clinical veritype, all suggesting that semantic expansion is a primary driver of the disease process in HD. So in the past, we very much thought about uh, HD as being associated with the expansion of a CAG repeat that causes a polyglutamine protein that then causes the disease. And uh, therapeutic efforts were really focused on those downstream part of the process. Now we have a new way of thinking about the disease that individuals inherit what might be a relatively small number of repeats, but by the process of somatic expansion, we get a much larger number of CAG repeats, particularly in the affected neurons, leads to a much larger polyglutamine tract that is what's then leading to disease. That process clearly driven by the number of repeats inherited, the age of the individual, the tissue and cell type in which that's happening, the presence or absence of variant repeats within the CAG, and variation in these DNA repair genes is driving that process.
And again, with the addition that we also potentially have this other pathway that's also important. And again, this is not to say that somatic expansion is the only thing that's important. That expanded repeat still has to do something, but it may be that once the repeat gets really big, there's really not much scope downstream of that for uh, an effective cellular response. It may be that once we get up into the hundreds of thousand repeats, subtle variation in your mitochondrial function or in neuronal protective genes just really can't cope once you've got a thousand repeats. So obviously this is a therapeutic opportunity. So if we could suppress somatic expansion, we'd reduce the size of the CAG repeats, reduce the polyglutamine load, and hopefully suppress the uh, presentation of the disease. And obviously one of the great things about these uh, genes is that they're nearly all enzymes. And obviously, again, we know that the one thing that drug companies do is can make uh, drugs that stop enzymes working. So I think there's a great potential here for therapeutic intervention in this disorder using this approach. Again, just come back. That talk I just given today, I could have more or less given exactly the same talk for myotonic dystrophy. All of those features are true in myotonic dystrophy, again, with the exception that we don't have the large, well-characterized cohorts that yet allow us to do the genetic modifiers, but at least the genetic instability, association with symptoms, et cetera, is true in myotonic dystrophy and potentially is true in uh, Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy and may also be true in this group of more than 50 disorders that also share similar genetic features, even though the symptoms are very different. And again, obviously, this is a big driver for the involvement of pharma that, again, we might be able to develop a drug that treats not just Huntington disease, but myotonic dystrophy as well, not just type 1, but type 2, and potentially all of these other disorders as well. So very exciting time. And again, I think illustrating how large, well-characterized cohorts can give new insights into the disease process. And again, just finally uh, end by thanking the guys in my group, uh, particularly Mark, um, Anna, and Vilia, who did most of the work that I presented today as part of our involvement in the genetic modifiers uh, group. So thanks to everybody else in, the, in that group. Thanks to all of the patients and families who contributed their DNA and clinical data to allow us to, to do these experiments, all the clinical colleagues who uh, collect and, uh, that data and our various other collaborators as well. And obviously not last but not least is the funders. So in particular, thanks to CHDI who fund the Enroll cohort, an amazing resource and the work that we do in our lab. So thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe two quick questions for Darren. Really nice talk, Darren. I was wondering if um, any individuals have been identified that have, say, compound variants um, for any combination of these modifiers, and if that affects their um, symptoms in any, or phenotype in any way. Well, yeah, so, so the, I think the question was, so do individuals have compound mutations in multiple of these genes. Yeah. So let me just clarify. So what we're looking at here is primarily common natural variants. Okay. So these are typically variants in DNA mismatch repair genes that have no association with cancer predisposition, for instance. Okay. So yes, we have all sorts of in those 4,000 individuals, we have every, probably every possible combination of those common variants. What we have done, we've got some data from exome sequencing, is that probably a subset of individuals maybe have some rarer, large uh, effect alleles, okay, that uh, may be more impactful in their their uh, action on the particular phenotypes. And again, that's something we're we're going forward with now. We're just hoping to get the data now from whole genome sequence from a first batch of around about. I think about 800 individuals with extremes of phenotypes. So people who are at one end or other base of the phenotype, uh, independent of the number of CAG repeats they've inherited and independent of their polygenic risk score for the known modifiers of disease. So the expectation is they may harbor other rare variants that may shed light on exactly how some of these genes are actually working. Very quickly, just start. Do you have any idea how those variants are? Gain or loss of function? So, yeah, so are these gain or loss of function? So that uh, that varies from one gene to another. So in FAN1, the data suggests that FAN1 is required to 
uh, suppress expansions. Okay, and in that disorder, the loss of function variants in FAM one. There is one relatively rare, clear loss of function variant that is present in individuals who have a much earlier onset than we would have expected. Whereas in MSH three, that's a gene that looks like its activity promotes expansions and gives an earlier onset. Um, and that, the variants there that are giving earlier onset are associated with higher levels of expression of MSH3. So we think most of these uh, modifiers are acting not as, they're mostly not missense or coding variants, they're probably mostly expression level variants, so relatively subtle variants that disturb, modify the amount of gene expression in any given cell type. So we're out of time for questions. Thank you very much.